going to invite you to take uh, your seat and to grab your Bibles or your Bible apps and turn to the Gospel of Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1 is our text for the day. If, uh, if you don't have a Bible with you or a Bible app on your device, that's fine. Grab one of the Bibles in the seats around you. Turn to page 959 and you will find Matthew chapter 1. It's the very first page of the New Testament that we're going to be looking at as we continue our series on Christmas. Hey, let me just mention something real quick uh, that I'm excited about. I don't want you to miss the opportunity. Uh, we are two weeks away from Christmas Eve. And so I hope you're ready for Christmas because it's coming whether you're ready or not. And, uh, and I, and there's two things. If you're here on, in town on Christmas Eve, I, I really encourage you to come to one of the services. You already heard Robert mention five services. Uh, and, and, you know, they're all going to be great, different styles, different times. We want you to come to worship, to celebrate. Uh, but the other thing is, uh, I really want to encourage you to invite your unchurched friends. And now, we always are encouraging you to invite your unchurched friends. We want you to, to reach out to your friends, neighbors, coworkers that, that don't attend church anytime and, and, and encourage them. But here's the reason why at Christmas, really want to encourage you, because this is the time of year when more uh, of people who don't go to church say, hey, you know what, if someone invited me, I would go. This is the time of year when people are, are open to talking about Jesus, singing the songs they know and love. Uh, so uh, take that opportunity. Look around you. Pay attention. I know you're distracted by the parties and the shopping and the wrapping and the family plans. But take this opportunity to say, God, who is it that I can reach out to? Who is it that I can invite? Who, who is my friend that really needs uh, just to be touched by God in a new way? And, and give God that opportunity to use you to lead somebody to a life-changing relationship with him. Now, uh, we're continuing our Christmas surprise series, and uh, we're in Matthew chapter 1 today, and I wanted to, to start off just by sharing something with you that I've thought about for a couple of months. And, and what I want to say is, dilly dilly. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good, it's Diet Pepsi. I'm really glad. Dilly, dilly. Some of you are like, uh, what in the world are you talking about? And which means you don't watch the NFL. Uh, and some of you are shocked right now that uh, your pastor would stoop to, to that low that he would mention a commercial that uh, represents an adult beverage. And, and, uh, and some of you are like, what's dilly dilly? Uh, it's, uh, go to YouTube after you leave here. Because if you all go to YouTube right now, you, it'll, it will be really slow. Uh, but uh, Plus, you need to hear the commercials, uh, not just see them. But uh, go to YouTube, check it out. When you get home, it, it's just uh, a funny set of commercials. And if you don't like it, then we'll just give you a tour of the pit of misery. So, uh, <laughs> now, a lot of you are surprised. The whole purpose of that was because uh, we're talking about Christmas surprise. And Christmas is so much about surprises, right? I mean, uh, the whole what is under the tree for me kind of thing. What's in that box that is wrapped for me? Uh, it's, and it's fun to surprise people with a great gift, isn't it? I mean, a lot of you put a lot of effort into that. You want to find the perfect gift, wrap it up, see their face when they open it. Uh, see, Christmas presents are always a surprise for me. I never know what's in them, unlike my wife, who has the spiritual gift of snooping. Although she adamantly said last night, I do not snoop, I find. So, uh, <laughs> spiritual gift of finding, whatever. But see, it's always a surprise for me. I don't know what I, I'm getting, and honestly, I don't know what I'm giving most of the time either. <laughs> Anybody with me on that one? Yeah, that's right, dilly dilly, huh? <laughs> we don't have a clue. So, uh, now we love good surprises, and that's what we're laughing about. But there are other kinds. There are those... Uh, you know, kind of bad surprises like, you know, getting laid off the week before Christmas, getting an unexpected bill, you get sick, or, you know, it can be 845 at night on Friday, you're in Bullhead City shopping with your wife and your car won't start, which happened Friday. Uh, so, uh, you know, you, you just, those are unpleasant surprises. You just don't like them. And you're like, oh, that's no good. And then there's the tragic kind of surprises. You know, you find out you have cancer. You are a loved one's in a devastating car accident. Or uh, you catch your significant other cheating. See, surprises that shake your world. And honestly, that's what Christmas surprises are all about. Matthew chapter 1, beginning in verse 18, 
A lot of you have read this before. A lot of you have heard this uh, your whole lives. Read it again, looking for the surprises, because there's the good and there's the tragic. Now, the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but knew her not until she had given birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. You see, if we're not careful, we assume that the story of Christmas is a lot like a Hallmark Christmas movie. Any fans of Hallmark Christmas movies in here? Yeah, uh, you're the people who actually know what's in the presents that we're giving. Uh, <laughs> but you know, Hallmark Christmas movies are always syrupy sweet, there's minor conflicts, and a predictable ending. But that is not the biblical account, and I hope today that you're surprised at the real story when we look at it once again. See, the story begins when Joseph assumed betrayal. Joseph assumed betrayal. Did you catch that verse 18? Now, the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child. From the Holy Spirit, but, but think about it. Joseph and Mary are engaged. It's really more than engagement. We don't really have an equivalent of betrothal in our culture. Uh, they were legally already married. They just weren't living together. They had not consummated the marriage. So they were not sexually active at all, and Mary shows up pregnant. So what would you think if you were Joseph? I mean, he knows that he's not the father of this child, and, and Mary has taken a trip to visit her cousin Elizabeth and has been gone for about three months, and she shows back up pregnant. And he's like, okay, so did you meet somebody when you were traveling? Did you, know, did you have a fling while you were gone? Did you get raped on the way? What, I mean, what happened? Uh, and he doesn't know. It just doesn't look good because, you know, he just assumed. There had been betrayal on her part. I mean, maybe she tried to convince him that, you know, it was God. <laughs> really? Can, can, if they had that conversation, can you imagine that conversation? So you're saying that God knocked you up. <laughs> okay, right, sure thing. So Joseph feels betrayed because that's how all of us would feel. And then Joseph made an honorable decision. Verse 19. And her husband, Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. He decided he was going to divorce her quietly. He was going to end the marriage and walk away. Now, he could have publicly shamed her. He could have dragged her out into the public square, accused her uh, of being a harlot, and had her executed for adultery. But he decided that he was going to take the, you know, the, the quieter route. He was going to be kind. You know, he was an honorable man. He kept his commitment. Uh... She broke it, but he was going to go ahead and, and treat this with honor, even if she hadn't. So Joseph made an honorable decision, and then Joseph received a surprising message. Again, Christmas story has already been a shocking surprise to him. He feels like his significant other has cheated on him. But look at verse 20 and 21. But as Joseph considered these things... Now, consider these things. He's laying on his bed. He's not sleeping. He's agonizing. He's going between anger and heartbreak and upset. His dreams have been destroyed. His plans for his life have been changed radically. But as he considered these things, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. And she will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus 
for he will save his people from their sins. Joseph, this is not what you think. Now, we don't know if Mary had communicated with Joseph her angel encounter. We don't know if there had been a conversation face-to-face where she's trying to explain how she ended up pregnant or if uh, he just saw her and said, it's over. Uh, but the, so we don't know if the angel was confirming her story or just showing up and telling him the story for the first time. It doesn't really matter. Either way, this is incredible. The angel tells Joseph, first of all, you're wrong about Mary. She didn't betray you. She has been faithful, and you should continue in the marriage. She's not, she's not uh, uh, what you think she is. And then secondly, this is a miracle. He's telling her, look, God is the one who, who uh, is the father of this child. This is a miracle that's never happened before. You've never heard of anything like this. It's never going to happen again. This is a one-time only thing. And, and so understand this is special, and the child is special. He is the Messiah. He is the Savior. So you're going to name him Jesus. And he's going to save his people from their sins. Not the Romans, because all the Jews wanted a Messiah. They wanted a Savior who was going to deliver them militarily from the Roman oppression that they were living under. They wanted a conquering hero to come in and, and, and defeat Rome and give them freedom as a nation. That's what they wanted for Messiah. And the angel tells Joseph, um, he's not going to be that kind of Messiah. He's going to save you from your sins. So Joseph received this surprising message, and then Joseph trusted God completely. Look at verses 24 and 25. It says, When Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but knew her not until she had given birth to a son and called his name Jesus. Joseph did what God asked exactly. Exactly. He took Mary as his wife, he, he honored her innocence. He named the boy Jesus. He trusted God completely. And understand, this wasn't easy. See, from where we sit, it just kind of looks like, oh, it's really easy. Of course Joseph did that because we know the story. Joseph and Mary, Bethlehem, Jesus, it, it's, it, we celebrate it. But do you realize how extremely difficult this was? It, Joseph demonstrated extreme humility. Because this is a lose-lose scenario for him. You know, unless you've been visited by an angel, this does not look good at all. Now think about this. Uh, Joseph's friends and families and neighbors believe one of these two things. Either that A, Joseph dishonored God by sleeping with Mary before they were legit and then lied about it. Or B, that Joseph is kind of being spineless and raising another man's son and his wife is a harlot. Can you just imagine the, the wedding reception? I mean, come on. A lot of times families are not really big fans of the, you know, daughter-in-law, son-in-law anyway, right? Because they're not good enough for your kid. Oh, come on. You guys felt that way, didn't you? I mean, maybe they proved themselves better than that. But yet, beginning, you know, there's no one good. If you're, a, if you're a dad of a daughter, there's no one good enough for your daughter. If, you're, if you've got a son, there's no... I don't know. I, I can just imagine the wedding reception and Joseph's, you know, mom and grandma and, oh, and cousins all sitting over there talking about, hey, you see her? She looks good for a harlot, doesn't she? <laughs> I just you can imagine the conversations. And Joseph is in the middle of this, and, and he obeyed God, even though it meant his reputation would be impugned. Do you love God more than your reputation? Would you trust God even if it meant losing your honor? And then Joseph continued to demonstrate humility because he changed direction and altered his actions. Think about this. He, he did a 180. H- have you ever done that? Have you ever completely changed direction that you had publicly declared, this is what I'm going to do, and then you turned around and went the other way? You see, Joseph declared his intent to divorce Mary, and then he ended up taking her as his wife. And Joseph declared that Mary had been unfaithful, and then he married her anyway. And he did it because God asked him to. Uh, I was reading this, and it occurred to me that it would have been so much easier on Joseph 
if God had told him about the whole Mary getting pregnant thing by him, like six or seven months earlier. You know, you know what I'm saying? Hey, you know, if an angel had shown up and said, Joseph, uh, by the way, here's what's going to happen. Uh, you know this girl that you're going to get married to? She's going to get pregnant. I'm going to be the dad. It's okay. So you just go ahead and know this when you see her pregnant. Here's what's happening. Okay, God, I got this. No, he didn't do that. He let him go through the whole angst and the stress. And, and oh, man, I can't believe she's been unfaithful. I got to divorce her and I'm going to do all this kind of stuff. And then, boom, an angel shows up and says, oh, by the way, it's okay. And then I realized that it would have been easier, but that's not what God does. Can you imagine if God had told you all the stuff you're going to go through before you went through it? A lot of us would have given up. A lot of us wouldn't have believed God. A lot of us wouldn't have trusted him at that point. And see, the truth is God meets us in that place of stress and trial and difficulty and angst because God wants us to trust him more. God wants you and I to trust him more. And, and we don't develop that trust. We don't grow that trust when things are easy. Because when things are easy, we don't really have to rely on God too much. But when things get difficult, that's when it drives us to our knees. That's when we hold on to God. That's when we cling to him. That's when we listen to him. And that's what Joseph did. He changed direction of his entire life because God asked him to. Changing direction like this is hard. I ask you if you've ever done that. Uh, I have. I have. Uh, I, I started down this road toward ministry when I was 17 years old. Felt like God was calling me into ministry. Went to college, got my Bible degree. I was going to seminary back in Kentucky. And, and as I was heading back there, a lot of my friends were going like, oh, you go back to Kentucky, you're going to end up being a youth pastor in the South. And I said, I will never be a youth pastor in the South. I am never going to, that's not what God's called me to do. I'm not going to do that. And they'd say, oh, yes, you are. And over and over and over again, I, I made this declaration publicly, adamantly, repeatedly, I am not going to be a youth pastor in the South. Went to seminary, had a great experience, Merle and I, uh, you know, learning a lot about God. Uh, as, as we were getting close to graduation, I sent my resumes out, and a lot of churches contacted me about being a youth pastor, and I said, nope, I'm ready to be a pastor, and that's what God's, uh, you know, prepared me for. I'm an interim pastor of this little church I'm at in Kentucky, so uh, that's what I'm going to do. And for four or five months, nothing. No doors open, nothing. Came home at Christmas, graduating in January, and uh, came home at Christmas, and I knew people in Arizona. I, I, I you know, muckety-mucks, important people. They, they could open doors. They could, you know, make things happen. I met with them. And they said, nothing. Got nothing for you. No deal. Nothing in Arizona. So I was disheartened. Uh, Merald and I were praying before we left to go back to seminary, and, and my prayer was, God, I'll go anywhere. I'll do anything you want, even if it's to be a youth pastor in the South. Didn't really mean it. Well, I meant it, but I didn't really, you know, expect it. You know, I just thought, okay, I got to, you know, do that. So we fly back to, to Louisville, and we walk into our, our apartment, and the phone rings. Now, those of you who can remember pre-cell phone days, that was kind of a big deal. Timing was everything, you know, literally. We walked into our apartment, the phone rings, and I answer it, and the accent is so thick, I can't even understand where the place is he's describing. I had to ask, can you spell that? And I was living in Kentucky. It's not like I didn't hang out with people with accents. And, uh, and he's like, hey, we want you to you know, come interview for being a youth pastor in deep south Georgia. And I'm like, oh, sure, okay. I, I, I can't say no. I already said I'd even do that. But I still thought God was just messing with me. He's not really going to take me there. He's going to open a door in Arizona or Colorado or someplace out way, you know. And, uh, you know, a month later, I'm down there interviewing, and, uh, and we went, and I served as a youth pastor in the South. And uh, I call that my wilderness wandering time. Uh, but, uh, but the reality is I ate my words because God asked me to. I changed the direction of my life because God asked me to. And, and, uh, and I had no idea at the time where I would be 29 years later. I had no idea at the time how God was going to deliver me from South Georgia. I had no idea what the things were that I was going to go through that God wanted to use to grow me. But I decided to trust God. And, and that's what Joseph did. He trusted God when he didn't understand. But God communicated really clearly to him. And I think God wants to surprise us today. And I think he's, he's whispering to our hearts some, some lessons that we need to learn from Joseph. 
So here's some things that, that I see in his life that I think we need to take away from. Uh, first one is stop assuming the worst about people and give grace instead. Stop assuming the worst about people. I mean, Joseph assumed that Mary had betrayed him. That was not the case. Yeah, the evidence pointed to that, but he made an assumption and he was wrong. And, and, and we're entering into a season where there's going to be lots of family time. I mean, yeah, we got to hang out with friends too, but family's coming to town and we're going there. And, and you know what we do with our family? We judge them, right? I mean, we just assume we understand their motives, their hearts, why they're doing what they're doing, how they're going to do that. And so we just judge them completely. And then we look for those things that reinforce our assumptions. See, I told you they were going to be like that. I knew that. And, and what ends up happening is we end up poisoning the well because we're judging them. And Jesus kind of said, don't judge because you don't want to be judged. And then he encouraged us. He said, take the beam out of your own eye before you try to take the splinter out of your brother's eye. In other words, work on yourself. Work on your own attitude. Work on your own motives. Work on your own heart and how you're approaching life with them. We make so many assumptions, and those assumptions end up being the, the, the toxins that poison our families. So let's give grace instead. Let's look for the best in people. Let's decide the best uh, motives or, or what they're doing or why they're acting. In other words, make them prove themselves unfaithful. Don't assume it. And, and by the way, can I just say, let that go with your, with your text messages and your emails and stuff as well. Do you realize that when somebody texts you, it's just words on your screen. There are no emotions attached unless they use, you know, the emojis to kind of tell you what they're thinking. And yet, how many times have you gotten mad because you misread what was intended off of a text? How many times have you lost it because you read into an email emotions that weren't there? And some of you are going, I'm always right. No, you're not. You know, the Bible says that all of us are sinners. And because we are sinners, we are unright, unrighteous, unright. That means you're wrong. Okay, just show me. You might be only 1% wrong. You might be 99% wrong. I don't really care. You're wrong. So you don't know. So why don't you give grace and assume the best? That, that's what, you know, giving grace means, that you're going to, you know, not read into it. You're going to let them explain you're going to ask clarifying questions instead of making accusations. Uh, and, and because when we assume, bad things happen. Let's give grace instead. That's what God did for us. And what a difference it's made in our lives. Let's give grace to other people. That's, I think that's the first lesson we need to learn from Joseph. Secondly, how about this? Be honorable even when others aren't. Be honorable even when others aren't. Uh, you know, character matters so much. We can't get away from that. It's one of our core values here at Calvary. We believe that you cannot represent Jesus unless you reflect his character. And again, you're going to be hanging out with family, and everybody's family is crazy. Uh, why don't you decide you're going to represent Christ by being kind and compassionate and forgiving? You be the one who refuses to, you know, to lose your temper, to give in to anger or resentment. And see how that changes the dynamic this Christmas with your family. You know, there's so many people who, who get upset because, you know, family did this. And, and they just kind of get on edge beforehand. And why don't you just ask God, just give you peace, and decide you're going to love them with the love of Christ like never before. Your words are going to be encouraging. Your attitude's going to be positive, and, and you're going to be full of grace. So nothing's going to throw you off. And if, if me just mentioning that kind of makes you antsy inside right now i've got a, a scripture passage i want you to meditate on which you read it every day now through christmas and just meditate on it and let god change your life romans chapter 12 verses 19 through 21 the apostle paul thinking about christmas said this do not take your own revenge but leave room for the wrath of god for vengeance is mine says the lord i will repay but if your enemy is hungry feed him if he's thirsty, give him something to drink. In so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. I like that part. <laughs> I do. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. What if we live by that? How will that change our family dynamics? How will that change the way we relate to each other? Earlier in that passage, the Apostle Paul says this. He says, 
Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Wow, what if we just live by that this season? What if we just live by that all the time? How's that going to change your relationships with your wife, with your kids, with your spouse, with your friends, with your extended family? So be honorable even when others aren't. It's not easy, but wow, is it powerful. And then finally, if God talks to you, listen to him. Listen to him. Joseph listened to God. He did what God asked him to. And, and so however God speaks to you, if God speaks to you from the Bible, which, by the way, we think is the clearest way that God speaks. He wrote it down, black and white, for you to be able to read, for you to be able to hear his word, his voice, which is why we offer these as gifts to you, because we want you to take it and read it, because if you read it, God will speak to you, and, and he will change your life. So if it's through the Bible, then listen. If it's through a sermon, then listen. If it's through the music, then listen. If it's through your devotional time, your prayer time, listen. If it's an angel showing up, by all means, listen. Look, change the direction of your life. Admit you were wrong. Repent. Uh, clarify with questions. Say, hey, what, what, what's going on? Do, but do what God says. Now, I, truthfully, I've never had an angel show up and speak to me that I knew of. But I've clearly heard from God at times in my life. So if God speaks to you, pay attention, trust him. It, it, let him change your life because that's what he wants to do. But I, I, I'm just going to promise you this. It's not going to be easy. It's not going to be easy to be kind and compassionate to people who are not being kind. It's not going to be easy to forgive people who, who have hurt you time and time again. It's not going to be easy to let go of that resentment, that bitterness. It's not going to be easy to, to just change your attitude. But if you will do what God says, you will experience his miraculous power. I mean, you may have to eat your words, you may lose your reputation, but you will experience the power of God if you do what he asks. Even if it means moving where you don't think you want to go, even if it means changing direction of your life, just submit to God and let him direct your paths. Because he'll never lead you astray. Now, this is the, this is the tough thing. I'm just going to say this. Because this is where a lot of us as followers of Jesus go off the rails. This is where we get stuck. Because we have heard from God at some point in our life, and we said no. We've heard from God and we rebelled. We heard from God and we defied him or we ignored him um, because we know that God told us to do something and we didn't. I mean, maybe right now you're just sitting here going, yeah, God's asked me to do this and I, I haven't done it. And so we get stuck and we look around and we see God's miraculous, life-changing power at work in other people's lives and we long for it and we ask for it and we say, God, I want to taste you again. I want to experience your power again. I want to see you change my life and my family like I see you do in others. And, and we're, we're crying out for it. And yet the power of God shows up when we trust him completely and we obey him. Because that's where he meets us with delight and with miracles, and, and with joy. So today, will you listen to God? Will you change directions? Will you follow Him? Because if you do that, God will surprise you this Christmas with His love and His grace. Let's pray.